Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today. We're broadcasting live from Park City, Utah. I think, Jeff, you're in Florida. South Terry. Beach. Yeah, South Beach. And Terry, you're in New York City. I am. Yeah. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, super big thank you to Jeff, who is, seems to be taking up all our screen right now. Uh, he has uh, been a dear, dear friend for a very long time. And about a year and a half ago, he introduced me to Terry and being an old rocker. And even though I cut my hair, really excited to be uh, involved in this. And and uh, uh, I know many of you are familiar with uh, many of the rock and roll stars that Terry is legendary for bringing to us, Jethro Tull, Pat Benatar, Huey Lewis in the News, an early agent, I think I'm accurate for Led Zeppelin. Correct. Uh, so, so a rock star in his own right. Um, so thank you, Terry. It's been nice getting acquainted and thank you for being here. Um, My pleasure. I think Great many of you might have. Yeah, thank you. Um, many of you may have seen the inaugural uh, uh, Chrysalis Orchestra that was done in New York City. We sent the link along, but we'll be sure to get it to you um, if you haven't seen it. Uh, Terry has voted with his own checkbook to get this thing started. It's To me, it's a daunting task to get all these wonderful musicians and uh, get them to play amazing rock and roll in, in an orchestra setting. And we liken it to the success that Trans-Siberian Orchestra has had for many, many years so there's an uh, a uh, uh, economic viable business here, and we're super excited to 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 have Terry with us today. So we're going to make sure that everybody gets in touch with each other. Uh, just to be super clear, we're raising money for this project. So if you if you are a musician and you want to play, it's uh, you've got to apply, and it's probably impossible, but you can try anyway. Uh, um and so that was kind of a joke that wasn't very funny um and uh uh so please view this with the intent that we're looking for investors the structure set up um and they're well on their way to to uh scaling this this project and super excited again to be involved um uh am i handing it to you terry or jeff you want to say a couple words first Excuse me. I'll be I'll be glad to say a couple of words first. You know, for me, it's an honor to be part of this as well. I uh, like all of us. I guess uh, love music. You know, we grew up with it. Its origin. You know, you don't know until you do know. And um, having met Terry and, and learning the stories of Jethro Tull and Jeff Beck and how it all began is fascinating. Even Paul McCartney in a little room uh, playing a piano with his good friend John and Peter Asher, the other partner. Uh, uh, so was called up to listen. They said, what do you think of this song? We're calling it, I want to hold your hand. You know, hearing these amazing stories and, and seeing the people that are behind it and you know, even those that sang them is an incredible thing. This is going to be such an exciting endeavor because we've got an all-star team building something that is impactful. If you watch the video, you, you get a sense of it. Being there is even greater, but if you haven't watched the video, uh, as you mentioned, we did a showcase uh, in last October in the city and you, you kind of riveted in your seat, listening to these incredible songs. So now we're turning into a real thing. There's, there's a dimension to this business that is exponential. There are a lot of aspects to it. And I'm gonna turn the mic over to Terry to talk a little about the past and you know what the future is gonna be. Terry, you got it, pal. Well, I think that everybody knows a little bit about my past, the people that I've been involved with. You know, I started uh, <clears throat> as an agent and found myself, I mean, I, I, I was friendly with a manager called uh, Peter Grant and uh, purely by accident became uh, the agent for Jeff Beck, who was a legendary rock guitarist. And Peter managed him and Peter uh, was very pleased with the job that I had done and said, you know, I've got a new band. Um, I've got a new band that I'm representing and I'd like you to be the agents. And um, he says, you know, I'm, I manage the Yard 
Yardbirds, another legendary rock name. And he said, but the, the Yardbirds have made so much money, they're going to break up. They've got individual plans. Uh, so they're breaking up. But the guitarist in the band is, is a... Uh, is new to the touring business and he wants to carry on so he's he's formed a new group a completely new group and they're going to call it the new yardbirds and i'd like you to be the agent so i became the agent for the new yardbirds peter took the band in the studio made an album took it to atlantic in in new york they said this is the best thing we've ever heard but you have to change that name so they changed their name from the new yardbirds to led zeppelin great so, uh, as a kid just out of college, I found myself to be the agent for Led Zeppelin. Um, I went on and I, I wanted to be a manager rather than agent. I wanted to work with musicians. And I found a little band called Jethro Tull, um, which, which I, I actually named um, because their original name wasn't very catchy. So we renamed them to Jethro Tull. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted a record deal for Jethro Tull, but none of the record companies wanted to sign them because they were a bit odd, uh, very theatrical, which wasn't, didn't seem to go down very well with, well, certainly with, with the record companies. So I couldn't get a record deal. So I started my own record company uh, called Chrysalis Records. So we went on from there. We had great success with Jethro Tull and went on and uh, Eventually, you know, I moved from the UK. I was in the UK. I moved to New York and opened a branch of Rick Chrysalis in, in actually in LA. Um, and I signed uh, Blondie and Pat Benatar and Huey Lewis and the News, Billy Idol, and launched their careers. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, when I was growing up, I'm probably a little bit older than many of you. When I was growing up, popular music was always played by orchestras. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm talking about pre-mid 50s, you know, in the late 40s, early 50s. And, and I mean, most of you will be familiar with, you know, the, the big band era with, um, you know, the Dorsey brothers and... Um, Benny Goodman, kind of, yeah. Benny Goodman, you know, um, and they they were the popular they were the popular music artists of the day, uh, and in England we had Joe Loss and Mantovani, and you, then you had uh, also after the big bands you had Mitch Miller here. So and if you if, when I was a kid, if you turned on the radio or television to watch to listen to or watch popular music, it was all orchestras. So I grew up very familiar with the trumpet, the trombone, the cello and the violin as being the music instruments that played my music. Um, rock and roll came along in the mid fifties and for all the good that rock and roll did, and it's given me a wonderful career and I love rock and roll and we all do. Um, one of the uh, bad things was that for club owners and promoters, um, the arrival of the pop group or rock group on the scene meant that it was more profitable for them to hire a four or five piece rock group uh, than a 20 or 30 piece orchestra. So the popular orchestra went out of fashion and, and eventually disappeared. So if you mention the word orchestra to somebody today, they immediately think of classical music because the only place they can go and see an orchestra play is the symphony. Um, and so the today the popular music lover has been disenfranchised from the orchestra and he wants to see an orchestra play everybody does and the orchestra is the most wonderful experience but he, you know he now thinks the popular music lover thinks that the cello and the violin are elite instruments you know the preserve of an elite audience um, and so they're frustrated. So what we're doing is we're bringing back, if you like, the popular orchestra. So we have a 40 piece orchestra playing the great compositions of the rock era. So, you know, we call it an orchestra because, you know, that's the only way to communicate the kind of instruments that people would expect to see. But in fact, it's basically a 40 piece rock band. It's a 40 piece touring rock band. 
Um, and you know there are you know examples. People have done something like this before, and and been enormously successful because the the demand amongst the popular music audience to see orchestras is is frustrated and it's enormous. I mean, as an example, there are two guys from Eastern Europe. Um, really good looking guys who play cellos. They play rock and roll on cellos and they do enormous business. Um, they come, they don't come to the US very often. I saw them at Radio City in New York a couple of years ago. When they come to the US now, uh, they play arenas only. They play 10 to, 10 to 15,000 seat arenas, sell them all out. Uh, there's an, another unit called um, Andre Ria, the Andre Ria Orchestra. He's a Dutch violinist. He has a 40-piece orchestra, 20-piece choir. He plays popular music, including Viennese waltzes. It's a bit cheesy, but again, does in incredible business. Um, and he, again, he comes to the US. He doesn't come very often. Most, most people have never heard of him. When he comes to the US, he plays arenas. Uh, you know, 10, 15,000 seat arenas. The audience for this is e enormous. Uh, you've all heard of the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. They play 100 shows every Christmas. Again, 10 to 15,000 seat arenas. So that's where we're going with the Christmas Orchestra. We, we do have a, a little clip. Uh, if you haven't seen the whole, uh, we did a showcase in New York, 30 minute showcase. If you haven't seen that, we're going to play you a little clip to give you a taste of what the Chrysalis, uh, Chrysalis Rock Orchestra looks like. Yeah, so I uh, put the link for the full YouTube in the chat box, folks, so you can click on that and watch it later. But let's see if I can't share this and play a little clip here for us. Can you see that? Yep. Is that the right spot, Terry? Yep. All right, I'm gonna hit play and hope that you yep. can hear it. You hear it? Here it comes. Yeah, that's good. Arthur, we can tell you're not a tech genius. Totally done. Longtime friend and personal physician, Dr. George Nicopolis, the autopsy revealed that Presley's colon was five to totally six inches. Totally done. Hang on, guys. Two inches. And mm -hmm. New York City just made a public announcement. And I have no idea how to turn that on. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. 
very prestigious Mount Sinai Gastrointestinal Motility Center. It's, it's really interesting what we're learning about that. Yeah, really. Between the microbiome and obesity. And is one of the very on, I think I got solving constipation for good. Her main area of research is on perfect digestion and achieving success. All right, that was fun. <laughs> Well, I, I was hoping you'd play a little bit more, Arthur, but uh, oh. hopefully people have got, have got a little taste and they'll want to go to uh, to see the full link. It, you know, guys out there, if you if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. You'll really, really enjoy it. Yeah, and I don't know I will, what the commercial would, was, but remember that commercial where he says, we sell goosebumps? I mean, I had goosebumps the entire time watching that, so I agree. You actually, Actually, your point is precise. You know, watching it, is one thing and it's great to see. Experiencing and being there is a completely different level. I was in the audience for that a showcase and I, I was riveted in my chair. It was the impact, just the, the 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 instruments of these amazing songs that we know from our youth and going back, it, it's, it, there's no better word to describe it other than riveting. It was just a riveting experience. And so, you know, I, I'm excited about what this is, is and what it's gonna be. You know, one of the things, you know, I guess it was about a year ago and uh, we first talked about this and then all of a sudden Terry shows up at the showcase and all these, and I said, how did you do that? How did you get all those people together and actually play an amazing few songs? And because uh, it seems pretty daunting to me. And he said it was not easy. So we think about having to, and a lot of those people weren't from the same place. You had to bring them in, right? Well, it, 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 first of all, you know, the, the thing about this orchestra, you know, people say, oh, it, it, you're, you're doing a 40 beast orchestra. Well, you know, you'll go out and hire 40 musicians. Well, no, I mean, you can do that, but then you just get, you know, the first 40 people who come through the door, you know, so it's a a bit like saying to Mick Jagger, well, you know, you, know, you don't need Keith Richard or the other guys. I mean, you just, you know, just pick up four musicians and go out and you're the Rolling Stones. Well, no, that's not, it's not quite right. <laughs> you know, yeah. that everybody in a rock band is important and, you know, and they all have their individual talents. And it's the same with, with this rock band. It's, they, there are 40 people and they're all important. They're all stars in their own rights. And it took us five years of auditioning, five years of auditioning to find the right people. And, and yeah, you know, and for the night, we decided to do the showcase. Now, of the 40, 15 of the musicians are from the New York area, 25 are from around the country. So for that, you know, one, one night or actually they were in for a couple of days because we had rehearsals. Um, we had, we had to bring in 25 musicians from around the country, you know, book their flights, get them to the airport, get them back from the, get, get them to the, the hotel here in New York, get them to the show and then get them all back home again. Well, that's, you know, it sounds daunting, but it, you know, it, it, if you're in the uh, touring music business, it's meat and potatoes. I mean, it's, it, it's just a question of uh, logistics. You know, we, we do that all the time. You know, when we're on the road, we'll be we'll be moving those uh, 40 people and, and the crew around on a, on a daily basis. And it's, as I say, it's meat and potatoes. How do you think it'll start? Meaning what size venues will you uh, uh, progress through? It, you know, it's really important to start in, <clears throat> in smaller venues um, because... You know, what I always say is that the, the, the two most important words in the touring music business are sold out. That is your biggest marketing tool. If the word gets out that this was sold out and there are people who couldn't get tickets, that's your biggest marketing tool. Then everybody wants yeah. to go. So yeah. we'll start in two, you know, 2,000, 2,500 uh, seat uh, halls. Um, and then we'll just gradually move up, you know, um, probably not so gradually, but you know, we'll move up the size of the halls. Um, our break even is at 4,000 uh, capacity, 4,000 tickets sold, that's our break even point. Um, beyond that, you know, once we get beyond 4,000, uh, it becomes hugely profitable 
but obviously the as we when we, our first shows you know those shows will lose money because you know, there's you know, not enough income from them so that's why we're raising the investment to finance our way through the first couple of years is playing in in halls smaller than 4000 what's what's the uncle point for a ticket especially when you're starting out what do you what do you we we budgeted based based on an average of uh, $60 a ticket really that sounds like so you're going you know it, super it, it reasonable sounds, yeah it, it, yeah it, it sounds low um, but you know it it it's enough it's enough um, for us to break even at 4000 and you know you want to sell the tickets yeah yeah you yeah want people in the seats you want to sell the tickets and uh, you know I say average of 60 in a so two and a half thousand seat hall, the, probably the front row, there'll be $150 and the back rows will be $30. But yeah. yeah. So where do you see yourself starting out in terms of uh, geography? Well, what we're doing is we're raising the investment in three tranches. So the first tranche is a million dollars. Uh, minimum investment of fifty thousand. Um, that will be enough for us to com to completely put the orchestra together, have the rest of the arrangements written, um, give us a week of rehearsal, uh, and allow us also to put together the full production, the lighting, have the lighting designed and implemented, a proper you know video production, and all you know all the things that go to putting on a, you know a, a great live show uh, in today's market. And then we'll do three concerts, New York, Boston, and Washington, D.C., as a sort of proof of principle. Um, and then when we've done that, then we'll, we'll go and raise the second tranche of money and do the first, first uh, national tour. So what, what do you think the next three cities are after those? Well, well, you know, no, we'll, we'll, the next thing will be to, to do a national tour. We'll, we'll go right across the country. Right across the country. Yeah. All, all the major cities. Yeah. And is it fair to prognosticate what you think the next round will be after the million? How much that would be? Uh, around three. Yeah. Yeah. And how long do you think it'll get you, take you with, you know, assuming, you know, a midpoint of success? to get to 4,000? Um, I would hope we're beginning close to the 4,000, um, you know, by the, the, the third year, uh, probably past the 4,000 in the third year. I, my guess is in, in we, we have, you know, we have budgets, they're all available with, uh, with our projections. Um, and you know it all depends on how quickly we progress but by the by i would say by the fourth year uh we should be getting in into profits and and the way we phrased it is that you know the first profits will go to pay back everybody everybody's investment so from the first profits people will get their money back so they won't you know they'll, they'll have their money back they can use to invest in something else and they'll just sit back and then wait to get the their, their profit checks right so, uh, you know, I haven't looked very closely at the numbers, but I did see them. Uh, and the, the, at scale, this is, you know, a multi hundred million dollar business. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Is it fair to compare it to, the amount of revenue on an annual basis that trans Trans Siberian brings in, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. As you say, you know, I mean, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me now, but you know, by the time you get to the ten thousand seat places, it's just hugely profitable, yeah. hugely profitable. And so, and um, what what we have in mind is, you know, once we get this first orchestra off the ground. Um, We'll start an international touring orchestra, and, and we believe we can uh, have also a, a permanent Las Vegas orchestra. And one of you know one one of the ways that you know 
that I will build this orchestra, you know, is to take the soloists in the orchestra and build them as, as stars in their own right. And, and they are the stars. And, you know, that's kind of what I've done my whole career is, you know, you, 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 know, you, you build stars um, by not just have you, you have to have great musicians or great singers and great um, uh, uh, songwriters, but then you, but you, you have to build their character and build them as exciting people, um, which, which all kinds of nonsense comes into play there. But you know, we'll build these soloists as stars with that, and the goal of that is to spin them off into their own career. So, you know, so the most, the, for us, success would be to, when we get to the point where our soloists are so, are so popular that we have to spin them up into their own careers. We can't keep them in the orchestra any longer, but of course they'll be contracted to us and they become another revenue source for, for the business. Was so, it, it was no go accident. Ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. I just want to jump in. So, so you talk about valuation and obviously valuation is predicated upon the success of the core business. But what's interesting about the core business is that it's a lot more than what we just think it is. Not just about ticket sales. I mean, if we rewind the tape of Terry's past, you know, he was bringing rock bands to universities. He was getting paid to bring them in. And that turned into, you know, Jethro Tull, who he wound up representing, and then Jeff Beck. And all of a sudden, he's doing the records. He's producing things for them. Uh, you know, the, the dimension of this gets very large. I, I met somebody that I introduced to Terry that building a platform from a technology perspective through the only for, through the entity itself where you have followers, you know, people that love what you do, you start building a population and they come and they become members of your population through technology and they pay for certain things that you do. Like we may have a, a soloist do a whole performance that you can come watch. It's a ticket price through you know, watching on, on your, your television or your iPad. And then each one of these things, the population becomes more and more valuable that certain you know, industries may want to market themselves to our population. That's not even projected in our numbers, but the power of what this is is exceedingly dimensional. I see this as clear as day being a marquee event at a major hotel in Las Vegas. And how much do they do? I mean, they their numbers are off the charts. But the, the brand and the strength of that brand and its value becomes very huge. So you talk about hundreds of million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of valuation. It's it's more than conceivable. This could be 500 million or five, six years from now. This is a giant thing. So to give you a sense of the opportunity, people that are coming in on this round for the million dollars are coming in at $8 million valuation. So, uh, you know, we're talking about if, you know, there's always, you know, if, but you got an A rock A team that's done it before. I mean, everyone that's involved in this are major players in the business. You have something that's tremendous in demand that the people are savoring, you know, since COVID presumably has ended, People are, you know, wanting to go out, they're traveling, they're going to shows, they're going, you know, to events. So there's a big demand and it's a phenomenal experience. So there's just great dimension. So I'm excited about it, um, being involved in it. I'm on the board of advisors and part of the team. And I, I get to know, meet all these people and watch it grow. And it's, it's just a very, it's very cool. And I think it's going to be a grand slam. That's my two cents. Yeah, uh, Arthur, and, I think one, yeah. somebody had a question. Yeah. So uh, actually, my good friend Don um, uh, insightfully asked about the uh, other ways to license or market this through Oculus or different types of media and that sort of thing. And so um, maybe you'd like to speak to the, you know, having it available to a fan base through other media channels, aside from having recordings on YouTube and that sort of thing you know, in the sort of metaverse context? Well, you know, we, we have a modest uh, social media presence right now, um, and, and we'll obviously build that. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll bring in you know, a specialist to do that. Um, but what, what we're focusing right at the mo on at the moment is, as, as, as uh, Jeff says, we have an A-team of professionals, people, you know, a, a half a dozen people who've been at the top of the, the of the rock and roll 
music business for a long time, uh, know their business really, really well. And part of the team is uh, a, a promoter called John Share. If you live in the New York area, you'll be very familiar with that name. He's a, a legendary New York-based music producer, music promoter, uh, probably the best independent uh, uh, concert promoter in the country. And he's part of the team. And, you know, he's been promoting rock shows all, all his life. I mean, you know, um, you know, knows everything about promoting shows. And he's our, he's our guru as far as you know, promoting the shows is concerned. So <clears throat> the first three shows, he'll promote himself on behalf of the company. And then as we go across the country, he will team up with independent, the best independent promoters in every city across the country. And, and they, and, you know, John was telling me the other day that I know he, he's done, if you, you wonder why people go to concerts and, and everybody uh, has, you know, ideas and, and all, all value, valid and valuable ideas about using social media and so on. And they're absolutely valid and relevant today, like never, but obviously not never before. But, you know, uh, John tells me that when he does surveys of people who come to concerts and he asks people, why did you come? Why did you come to this show? What prompted you to come to this show? And he says, nine out of 10 people tell them because a friend told me about it. Yeah. A friend came and said, you got to go. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as I say, we have the best professionals uh, on the case who, who, who know their job really well. It was, is John the fellow that was the gent that was in the video as well? Was that John? Who was your partner? No, there? that's Peter yeah. Asher. And so tell us so about part, him. Part, of, part of the show, folks, when if, when you look at the video, um, you know, is, you know, we don't we don't just have the musicians you know, playing the songs. We, you know, I'm on, you know, I'm on the stage along with Peter Asher. I don't know. I mean, many of you will be familiar with Peter Asher. He was a, a, a rock star of his, himself with a, a a pal called Gordon Waller. They had a, a duo in the 60s called Peter and Gordon who uh, were, you know, toured the United States with the Beatles and, and uh, Herman's Hermits and Dave Clark Five and so on and so forth. And then he, when he retired as a, a, a singer, he became a producer, a manager and became best known as the producer and manager of Linda Ronstadt and James Taylor. Um, but he still does his own show, and, and Peter and I are on the stage between the numbers, introducing the songs, telling the history of the songs, who, who wrote them, why they wrote them. Um, many of those stories people don't know, and obviously, you know, between us, Peter and I knew or know or knew most of the people in the rock music business. Um, so we, we, we do that, and we also introduce the musicians and feature them. Uh, so we you know we're the sort of connection on the, on the stage uh, you know between the show and, and when and when you know in a few years time when Peter and I decide that uh, we need to pass the gauntlet to, to pass the hat to somebody else there'll, there'll be other people who come on and do the same thing well-known people who who have that experience was uh, uh, being you have the Jethro Tull in your background and uh I think I wore out the Passion Play more times than than I can remember. Uh, was it? There were some uh, stunning solos in the showcase. Uh, it was it no mistake that one of them was a flautist that just killed it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. She was amazing. No, yeah. she, she Melissa is fantastic. Yeah. She, and she's she's going to be a big star. Yeah, it's just going to be a big. Stuff. And the guy with the saxophone, he was just yeah. killer too. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Well, they know. Uh, uh, playing that clip, you didn't get the flavor of what, what how important the soloists are. You know, so it's you know, seeing Chrysalis Rock Orchestra, it's like you know, seeing an orchestra play, but all of a sudden you've got a, you know, a top jazz musician stepping in and playing a, an improvised solo. So, you know, it's it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. It sure is. So what's the, what's the, uh, let's talk about time frame. 
uh, how much time do people need to hurry up and send money? Jeff? Well, we, we have an offering memorandum currently that we're sending out. We, it's been about uh, 10 days now that it's been available. We already have gotten commitments and money starting to come in. My expectation is that by June, um, we will be fully subscribed. Um, and um, that's, that's the quest. It may be much sooner. Uh, literally started about 10 days ago and uh, a lot of people are looking at it. Again, some people have committed and it's a matter of, you know, who comes and who we can have the pleasure of meeting and talking to Terry and meeting us and being part of this, you know, great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Hurry up and send money. <laughs> uh, super exciting. Well, we're uh, to any, anyone in the anyone in the audience that's listening and, uh, you know, please go listen to if you've not watched the, the showcase, you must. And after you do, if if you have a, an interest and you'd like to learn more, have a one on one with Terry and I, we're available 24 seven. Well, I'm, I, he goes to sleep a little earlier than I do, but most of the time, 24 seven. And you know, we'd, lo we'd love to meet you and talk to you and give you a sense of, you know, the breadth of what we're doing. Yeah, and I'd also encourage you that if we're, after hearing what you've heard today, folks, that if there are others you think would enjoy being part of this uh, enterprise uh, and uh, being part of the excitement, you're certainly welcome to to bring them in. There's no barrier to to who can can write a check here. So, uh, um, well, the, the only barrier is accredited investors. We can only take accredited right. investors. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, thanks for clearing that up. Um, and we're going to record this. It's recorded. And if it's okay with you guys, we'll post it. And so if you want to send some people to listen to this also, but uh, it'll be available and we'll make it, sure everybody's in touch directly with Jeff and, and Terry uh, afterwards. And uh watching the the showcase is just absolutely stunning so as jeff said don't miss that independent of your investment interest because it'll be a lot of fun for you to watch um make sure you leave the pop message in the recording that is classic oh the poop message <laughs> <laughs> thank you don <laughs> well we encourage good digestion Right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining today. And thanks, Terry. It's good to see you and Jeff as usual. Great and, to see you, Arthur, and, and everybody else who's, who's watching. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Yeah, for sure. And uh, as I always say, thank you for sharing with us the only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time. Till next time. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye bye.